Hello, good morning for some of you, good afternoon for others, and welcome to the RISE webinar Wednesday series. For those of you not familiar with RISE, Rising Insurance Star Executives, or RISE for short, is the young professionals group for the insurance industry. We're composed of hundreds of professionals across all disciplines, from claims to underwriting, from product to sales, from actuaries to legal, even students looking to get into insurance. RISE offers webinars, networking opportunities, scholarships, a job board, annual awards, and more. Best of all, it's free to join. Uh, I'm Amy Cooper, founder of RISE, and before we get started, I have a few exciting announcements. The inaugural meetings for our four committees are coming up in the month of October. Committees are the best way to get involved in RISE and meet other members. On October 6th at 3.30 is the first Diversity and Inclusion Committee meeting hosted by Chair Payal Patel and Board Sponsor Abel Travis. On October 7th at 3.30 Eastern is the first Engagement Committee meeting hosted by co-chairs Ben Rosser and Amanda Skin and joined by Board Sponsor Rich Dowd. Uh, the Innovation and Education Committee meeting dates will be announced shortly and you can sign up for committees on riseprofessionals.com under resources. A little quick housekeeping on today's webinar before we get started. Please feel free to use the chat function to respond to Dave and interact throughout the webinar. Any questions, please submit those through the question function and we will address those in the Q&A at the end. Now to today's webinar, uh, Stand for Your Brand. I'm pleased to welcome Dave Gordon. Dave Gordon is an internationally recognized brand, marketing, and communications expert. He's an inspirational speaker, author, coach, and leader on a mission to help people identify, communicate, and deliver their unique value to build stronger personal team and corporate brands. Uh, and with that, Dave, go ahead and take it away. Great. Thanks, Amy. And thanks, everyone, uh, for joining today uh, from wherever you are and uh, whatever laptop you're, you're watching on. Uh, really appreciate uh, the time to, to be with you. Uh, I personally have only been in the insurance industry uh, for about six years. So I know a lot of you are what we would refer to as young talent, um, high potentials, uh, but I always feel like that myself. Uh, although I am almost 53 years old, uh, I have a unique background, which I'll go into and makes me qualified to be able to talk to you about this idea of stand for your brand. Uh, I'm the chief marketing officer for Gallagher Bassett and doing that, as I said, for about uh, six years. Uh, before that, I had my own uh, branding agency uh, and also was in the experiential marketing world for a number of years. And before that, I was an actor. So if anybody has seen the show Friends, I did not get that part. That's why I'm here today. Uh, actually, I did audition for the role of Joey. Uh, my kids love that, but uh, no, didn't get that. So here I am. Uh, and, and here's the thing. Uh, I've had a unique um, journey, let's say, uh, in my career. And what I want to do is share with you uh, the principles, the techniques that I've picked up along the way throughout being an actor, experiential marketing, marketing, coaching, leadership, training, all that sort of stuff. And I put that into a presentation today. Uh, I've been doing this presentation now for close to 10 years, uh, and I think you'll enjoy it. Um, I've got about 111 slides to go through. Uh, for those of us in insurance, don't worry. They're not those kind of slides. Uh, they are slides that will keep you focused. So if you are trying to multitask right now and you're looking at something else, you may miss something. So if I could have your full attention, uh, that would be awesome. So back in my marketing days, uh, experiential wise, I did a lot of launches, launch meetings, uh, corporate pep rallies, whatever you wanna call them, but we launched a lot of products and services. And I would like you to think of today as a launch for yourself. How many of you think of yourself as a brand? And I can't see you right now. We'll get into the chat, but I want you to think about that for a second if you've ever thought of yourself as a brand. And if not, that's a good thing because today is launch day. Today, we're gonna launch you as a brand. We may have to do some work uh, after the hour that I get with you. But today, if you think of yourself as uh, just someone who works in insurance or just someone who has a particular role, I want you to wipe that out of your your thoughts right now and just focus on, on me and my message today because I think I'm going to change your perspective. So I think we can all agree that your reputation is your greatest asset, right? Your personal life is directly connected to your public life. There is no more work and private. What you do in private could affect your work and vice versa, right? 
and you are responsible for your success. Every one of us, including me, has a boss, and our boss wants to help us. I'm sure of that. They want you to be successful, but at the end of the day, you are responsible for your own success. So we need to keep that in mind. Okay, so what's a brand? I'm gonna start off being interactive, and if you wouldn't mind, as Amy said, using the chat box, one or two words, what's a brand? Just give me a, a quick one or two word in the chat box and let's see if this thing works. Just type your message in there. Got it, a label, a company, a unique identifier. Good, keep going. Identity, excellent. So is this a brand? If I asked you if this is a brand, you would probably say no, right? You'd say this is a cup of coffee and you'd be right. It is a cup of coffee. And think about it this way. If you're a coffee drinker and this is the only thing available to you back when we used to go to hotels for conferences and they would put coffee out in the middle and you didn't know what you were drinking, but you drank it anyway because you had a night the night before, it's insurance. We all do that, right? You need that coffee. And so if you had your coffee and say, okay, I'll take whatever's available, fine. But what happens when we offer up a choice? I live in New York, if you can't tell from the accent already, tried to get rid of that, but it's always there. And these are my choices. I'm a big Starbucks fan, uh, so I'll choose Starbucks. And I know a lot of folks, Dunkin' Donuts, there's a lot of fights. It's almost like Republicans and Democrats around here. But if you think about that, you've got choices now. So think about it this way. That one cup of coffee that you were perfectly fine with, that was the only thing available, it was good. But now you have a choice, and now what are you gonna pick? You're gonna pick your brand. You're gonna pick the label. And what is it that we're really buying here? I mean, think about it, it's coffee, right? It's dirty water. So when we think about it, what are we really buying? We're buying the label. That is a brand. And not only are we buying a label, but we're actually most likely paying more for it. Because I know that, that coffee without the brand on it, if you live in New York and you go to any bodega and you get a little cup of coffee that says coffee on it, chances are that's a lot cheaper than a Dunkin' Donuts or a Starbucks. That is a brand. Brand is important. It's your label, right? Is anybody going home with a six pack of the one in the middle? Of course not, because you don't know what's in there. What about beer? No, it's beer. Who cares, right? I mean, it's pandemic. We'll take beer. We'll take anything. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but think about it. Actually, I'm not kidding, because when I was an actor, uh, I was also a bartender, because those two go hand in hand when you're trying to pay the rent. And when I was bartending, if you really think about it, people would come into my bar and they would ask for a beer. They had a relationship with their beer. I'd actually have people walk in and ask for a Bud Light or a Coors Light, and we would only sell Miller Light, and they would walk out. They would leave their friends. They'd say, I'm not drinking that. That's not my beer. So we all have relationships with our brands, right? If you think about detergent, same thing. When I go to the market, I am looking for one kind of detergent. And my, my wife says, go get whisk. My mom actually used whisk too. I mean, so I'm conditioned to a brand. When I go down the aisle, I'm looking for a label. And chances are you do the same and it might be different products, different, different things that you look for, but we're all looking for the label. For those of us in, in marketing and branding, there's a reason for that. And it goes back to this idea of decision fatigue. So what is decision fatigue? It is too many decisions, right? You start off your day, right? It used to be, what do I wear to work? Now we're just wearing you know, shorts and a t-shirt. No, I'm kidding, we do get dressed for work. But if you think about where, how do I get to work? Which client am I gonna call first? What am I going to do? All these decisions add up. So by the end of the day, you are fried. And so what do we need? We need help in making our decisions. And that's where brands come in. Brands come in because they offer a promise of value. This is the logo for my company, Gallagher Bassett. I worked on it, right, to create it. And if I showed it to someone, I would say, is this a brand? Now, if you're a part of Gallagher Bassett, I'm hoping you're gonna say yes. But if you're like my son, who's very literal, he would say, well, it's actually a logo on a screen. And you'd be right. So what makes this a brand? It's not the cool font. It's not the actual picture. It's the people. It's the people who make up the company that make up the brand. 
And that usually comes down to service. It is a unique promise of value. A brand says, I'm going to offer you something of value. And if you pick me, I'm going to give that to you repeatedly. I'm going to make sure that you are taken care of. Okay, so that said, what is a personal brand? So that's my next question to you. What is a personal brand? If I just told you what a brand was in the chat box, throw me up, what's a personal brand, anybody? What others think of you? What else? Personality. Reputation. What defines you? Excellent. These are all great answers. How people perceive you. Excellent. I would like to get some more people in the questions here. I'm seeing a lot from Amy O'Brien. I know you, Amy. I know you, Karen. Uh, what people expect from you. Character. Absolutely. Those are all parts of a personal brand. I'm going to make it very simple for you. A personal brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. Think about that for a second. What people say about you when you're not in the room. You can say anything you want about yourself. You can create a great CV, you can create a resume, you can put your, your thing on LinkedIn, you can do whatever you want. But what do people say about you when you're not around? And nowadays, while we're all in this pandemic, we're all distanced from one another, we're not in the same room. So what are people saying about you now? What are you doing to foster your personal brand? And here, here's the thing. So I live in New York, as I said, uh, I'm a New York Giants football fan, uh, and my neighbor across the street, he's a Jets fan. And when I say he's a Jets fan, um, his house is green, his car is green, he flies the flag, the, do the dog's not green, but, you know, got the collar and everything else. Everything is all about the Jets. So when he invited me over a few years ago to, uh, to a game, the Jets were playing, Giants weren't, went across the street. Uh, but before I went, I went to the store. Uh, to get something, and I saw a bottle of this, Jets Uncork, and I said, ah, oh, this will be fun. I said, I'll get a couple of bottles of this, I'll bring it over, it'll be a joke. You know, we all know that the Jets suck, right? So I figured the wine's probably not very good either, but this will be fun. And I walked in the door, and I gave him the, the first bottle, and you would have thought that I just handed him a $2,000 bottle of wine. He took it, he cradled it, and he showed all of his buddies. Now, they weren't big wine drinkers. They were more like Coors Light guys, right? And they're like, and he's looking at the, he's looking at the bottle. And he's like, this is the best. This is amazing. And he takes it and he puts it up on his mantle, like right next to like his wedding photo and pictures of his kids. Like this was important to him. And I thought, this is interesting. Like I just matched who he was, his label, everything about him. All I did was give him a $15 bottle of wine. It still sits there today probably vinegar, but that's okay, right? Because I matched it and I said, All right, let me let me try this at home. And so one day I came home, not with our regular wine, but a bottle of this and I gave it to my wife. And I said, this is for you. Now my wife is a middle sister of five kids. Uh, she does surf, goes to the beach a lot. Uh, we live on Long Island and uh, she wears big hats. So I said, this is great. And then I brought it to her and she smiled and she said, you know, I'm glad that's how you see me. You know who I am. I thought this would be fun. So I actually uh, said, well, next time you go to the store, why don't you pick up a bottle for me? Here's what she gave me. So you can see how we can do it. This is fun, by the way. I would recommend this. And nowadays we can do it with craft beer. Uh, if you have client services, it's a fun thing to do. If you are doing a socially distanced backyard barbecue or something like that, it's fun to bring something that represents a label. I do not recommend you doing this um, with your, your spouse or significant other uh, if you had a fight uh, and you're trying to be a smart ass like I did once. Uh, my wife and I had a, a big fight and I was at the store. It, it, I mean, it sounds like I'm going to the wine store a lot. I actually do, but you know, I'm an alcoholic, so I'll just put it out there right there. But I'm at the wine store after this fight and I saw a bottle of this, so I brought this home. Yeah, that didn't go over well for me that night, but my wife did get me back because a week later I came home to an empty house and this on, on the counter. So you see what we do with labels here. Labels tell a story. Labels are who we are. So I'm going to ask you a question. For those of you who don't know me, Amy and Karen, and everybody else, what's my label? 
I, I'm not in front of you. I'm not on stage like I normally am talk, talking to hundreds of people. We're just sitting there having a conversation, but I've now been talking to you for roughly 14 minutes. What's my label? Give me one word that describes me. One word. It's okay, I can take it. I watched the debate last night. Mr. Personality, entertainer, presentable, charismatic. Thank you very much. I wish my wife was in the room with me right now. Um, those are all great, thank you. Uh, and you can keep going if you want. Um, but here's the deal, right? We've just met. That's my label. That's how you see me based on how I'm presenting myself. So I have a question for you. What's your label? What's your label? Think about it. If you had to describe yourself in one, if I was coming over to your house with a bottle of wine and I could create that label, what would it be to match who you are? So actually, I'd love for you to, if for those of you who are thinking about that and want to play along, you can write that in. And I was kidding, Karen and Amy, you can join if you want to. I was just joking around. Janine, I'm not sure if professional is myself or you, but we'll, uh, we'll start there. I'm just looking over. Come on, folks, this is interactive. I've got 30 people on the line. Give me some words that you think would describe your label. Dependable, Benjamin, thank you. Problem solver, thanks, Matt. Anybody else? Outgoing, Katerina, good. Efficient, thank you. Social, excellent, okay. So you see what I'm doing here? This is what I would say, how you assess yourself. I could ask you 50 multiple choice questions about your brand, but at the end of the day, what do you think people say about you when you're not in the room? And what I wanna do today is talk a little bit about brand consistency. There's four cornerstones to building a brand. I do this for Gallagher Bassett. I've done it for clients my whole life, and I do it for myself. When I found personal branding as a vehicle, to take charge of my career and my life, everything changed. And I wanna share with you a couple of secrets around that, some tools, some tips all along. And this goes back to this idea of brand consistency. There's four cornerstones. So we're gonna take them one at a time. Identity, identity starts with self-awareness. Who are you? It's really easy to look at other people. It's really easy to say he or she, they are what, right? We can, I, we judge and that's what we do. But what about ourselves? We don't want to turn inward and look at ourselves because then we might be forced to actually change, change something that we don't like or something that's not working. So what I, I don't have a tattoo, but I'm fascinated by them. Again, Long Island, summertime, I see a lot of tattoos. And the thing about a tattoo is you people actually brand themselves, like literally brand themselves with a symbol or a word or something that's meaningful to them. So obviously, if I show you this, right, and I ask you what's most important to this person, you're going to tell me music, right? That's an easy one. If I show you this, well, now we're getting a little bit vague, but something with the sea, the ocean, could be a lifeguard, could be a sailor, right? Something with the water. What about these guys? What's the story here? And here's the thing. I, I, I tell you this is a metaphor because this is how most people communicate about themselves. They try to be everything to everyone. I guarantee there's a story here. There's probably a lot of stories here, but there's so much that we really don't know who they are, what's most important to them. And that's what we need to do when we tell a story about ourselves, when we think about our brand. We can't be everything to everyone. So it's not just tattoos, right? I was actually behind this car uh, taking my son to school years ago. And I took a picture of it at the red light because it was just, it's fascinating to me what people put on the back of their cars. It's a temporary tattoo, if you will, right? I mean, look at the back of this car. What's most important to this person? Family, obviously. We know what schools they go to. We know football is important. And they're a big, huge, obnoxious Yankees fan. I can say that I'm a Yankees fan, right? So when you think about what's on the back of the car, what's most important to people? Do you think this person wants you to know that their kid swims. Of course they do. It's all there. It's all the stickers. It's all in the back of their car. So my question to you is, as you are early on in your career, what do you want to be known for? Think about that. What do you want to be known for? 
in one word, could you describe your brand? What do you want to be known for? And I'll give you an example. As a company, Volvo is known for one thing. First one to get that right, go. First one to get that right in the question bar, what is Volvo known for in one word? There you go. Benjamin said safety, You're, you win. Safety, safety, safety. Everybody said safety. How great is that? Who did that? Volvo said, yep, we got cars, this, that. Think about all the other cars that are out there. What are they known for? There's slogans, right? BMW's got the driving machine and all that. But when you want a safe car, what's your first thought? Your first thought is a Volvo. That is tremendous branding and tremendous marketing. Your, your brand is 24 seven. And I run into this all the time when I coach people and they say, well, I got my brand at work and then I've got my brand at home. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way anymore. And what that's gonna do is confuse yourself. And we talk about work-life balance. There is no more work-life balance anymore. It's all integration. So when you think about what your brand is, it's gotta be 24 seven. It's gotta be that one word that describes you both at home and at work. So I'd like you to think about this for a second, right? The first question about what your label is, that was kind of right off the cuff, right? I was basically asking you, okay, what do people say about you? This is what I would call your aspirational brand exercise. What do you want to be known for? If you could be known for just one thing, at work, at home, in your life, what would it be? Now, it took me, it takes, when I coach people, it could take months to get the word quite right, but I'm gonna put you on the spot here. And I'm gonna ask you, top of your, and I'm not gonna hold you to it, but in the answer section, right, in the, in the question and answer box, I would like you to write down here what it is. What is your one word? Integrity, dependable, compassion, helpful, dependable, greatness, problem solver, keep going. I got 30 people on the line. Organized, kind, efficient, strength, excellent, reliable, caring. These are all great words, right? Now, when you think about this word, when you think about your brand, think of it this way. This word, this brand, it needs to launch you out of bed in the morning. It means when you wake up, you've got to feel like, yep, this is my promise to the world. Your brand just like I talked about earlier, it is a unique promise of value. And when you make that promise, you have to deliver on it. So if your word is confident and you wake up and you're not feeling very confident, then can't expect that to be your driving force, right? If your word is caring and you wake up and you start yelling at people, that's not, that's not brand on brand behavior, right? So this has to be a word that just launches you out of bed. And it also has to deal with your purpose, right? Why are, why are you waking up? And when you go to bed at night, do you feel satisfied? Do you feel like you achieved something? Do you, do you feel like you delivered on that unique promise that you made to the world? And so uh, hold on to that for a second. I've, some of these words are great, but I wanna delve in a little bit more towards uh, purpose. Again, another drinking picture. But if, if we were meeting, let's say at a conference, let's say Rise was having a conference and we all got together after the presentation and we were having a drink and I said, what do you do? What do you do? How would you describe yourself? What do you do? Chances are you would tell me your title. You would tell me you work in the insurance industry. You would tell me your company. Most people, that's what they do. About 90% of the people do that. But here's something that I would like you to take away. And I'm going to point out a few things that I think you should just take with you as you go. Is what you need to do is start with the phrase, I help people. What do you do? I help people what? Think about that for a second. It takes away the title. It takes away the company. It takes away insurance. It actually, I call this a purpose statement. Every company as, as a, a motto, a credo, taglines, whatever. As people, we all also need a purpose, right? Sometimes we feel like we're burning out. We're not burning out because we're tired of what we do. We're burning out because we forget why we're doing it. And so what we really need to think of is our purpose. And creating a purpose statement starts with, this is mine. 
I help people identify and communicate their unique value to build stronger personal team and corporate brands. It works for me at work. It works for me when I speak, when I coach, when I write, and it works for me at home too. Coach my kids uh, from an early age, and it was always about helping them build a stronger brand. I tried to coach my wife, that didn't work. Don't recommend that. But find the people that you can coach, right? That's what I've done. So think about your purpose. And this is a hard thing to do. Like I said, it took me about three months to get this quite right. I had some words, worked it around. It worked for me at work, didn't work for me at home. Then the one worked at home, didn't work. It's gonna take you a little while to get there. I guarantee you for the 31 people, uh, 30 people plus me on this webinar, if you do this, if you focus in on your brand, if you focus in on a purpose statement, it will be your North Star. It will be a driving force so that every decision you make will not be a one-off. There will be a purpose to it. And it also is helpful for your team because if you think about it as a, as a manager, a manager is thinking, what do we want to be known for? If you're in a certain division of a certain company, the manager is thinking, yeah, what about the team? I'm thinking about me personally. You're thinking about you personally, but what about the team? And I'll give you an example. Iron Man. Iron Man, let's say, is your personal brand. Iron Man is part of a team, the Avengers. The Avengers are part of a corporate entity, Marvel Universe. Personal team, corporate brand. It all has to be aligned. The personal brand, the team brand, the company brand, and the customer brand. Think of it that way. If you're not selling, if you're in sales, if you're not making a connection, there may be a reason for that. It may be that you as a person are not connecting to the brand of your customer. So understanding who they are and who you are and trying to find that match. What do we stand for? That's what you have to remember as part of a company, as part of a team, you have to stand for something as a we. And I'll give you an example. So I'll show you this picture. This is obviously Girl Scout cookies. And Girl Scout cookies are sold by Girl Scouts. Chances are in front of a supermarket or somewhere local in your local community, right? They sit there and they basically stand there and they guilt you into buying these cookies as you walk into the market, right? So what would you say about the Girl Scout that in San Francisco who stood outside of a legal marijuana clinic and sold cookies and sold 117 boxes in 45 minutes? What word would you use to describe her? Give me that in the, uh, in the question chat box there. What words would you use to describe her? Brilliant, genius, smart, resourceful, smart. A lot of smarts in there, right? So what happened? What, ha what did the Girl Scouts of America do with that girl? And I've asked this question before. I've gotten answers like they fired her. You can't fire a Girl Scout, right? But they did make her stop. You can't set up camp outside of a legal marijuana clinic because look at the picture. As we get into more and more legal marijuana, uh, in the different states, imagine what that would do to the brand. Think about that brand, right? It's like, well, it's a, it's a good business model, right? If you want to sell cookies, but not great for the brand. And that's where you got to really remember that whatever your brand is, whatever company you're working for, if they're not aligned, that's going to be a problem. So make sure that whatever your brand is and the company you work for and the team that you're on, that there needs to be brand alignment across the board. Okay, so that's identity. Um, I've got about a half an hour to go through the next three stuff, so I'm gonna move quickly. Identity, right? So you figured out your brand. Now, how do you communicate it? Well, nowadays we can communicate to everyone anywhere, right? Twitter, I mean, you name it. We're all photographers, videographers, we're newscasters. We can be anything. We can talk to the world, but most people have not been trained to talk to the world. And so what that does is it confuses people, right? Why do we communicate? And when I ask this question, a lot of people will tell me, well, they communicate to get information, to share information, uh, to get stuff done, right? Those are all correct answers. But from this day forward, as you're communicating, as you're thinking about the way you communicate with your team, with your customers, even with your family members, why do we communicate? We should always communicate to connect. Anything else is noise. If you are not truly trying to connect with an audience, then it's noise. I think we have a problem. I, we have a lot of problems, but I think we have a problem in communication 
and I call it garage sale communications. I think there's just too much communication out there and it's kind of like a garage sale. What happens? You basically throw all your stuff on the front lawn, on the driveway, and you say to people, here you go, here's all my stuff, you pick through it, you tell me what's valuable. And if we are doing that with our customers, and when I say customers, it can be internal or external, even family, right? When we're just blah, vomiting out, all of our information out there, whether it be from branding, sales, even just operations, we're basically saying, here's all the stuff. You go read that email. You go pick through it. You find out what's most valuable. It's not a great brand. You're basically saying to people, here, here's all the stuff. I have no desire to help you with your time and your efforts. So I want you to think about that if you think about the way you've been communicating to people. The sex, success of your communication we judge not by the knowledge you send, but by what the listener receives and how they respond. If people are not responding, if they're not following you, if they're not uh, jumping on your ideas, that's not their fault, that's your fault. And that's only your fault because you haven't really figured out how to communicate your, your brand, but also what that idea is. Aristotle said a long time ago that you need three things to be persuasive. You need ethos, pathos, and logos. I had no idea what those meant, so I had to look it up. And it really comes down to credibility, emotion, and logic. In the insurance industry, it's all about credibility, right? Everybody's credible and everybody's logical. It's all about data. It's all about what you've done in the past. But what a lot of people will forget, and especially as young talent, I want to remind you, emotion. We buy things on emotion. Every purchase you make, when I say purchase, it could be the purchase of an idea as well, is emotional. We have to have some sort of emotional connection. I'll tell you a quick story. When my daughter was 11 and a half, she wanted an iPhone. And my wife and I were in the communications industry, so we said, no, at that time, you know, you're not ready. There's a lot of bullying going on. It's not safe, predators, all that sort of stuff. So we said, no. So for about a year, year and a half, she would come home from school, all her friends were getting iPhones, and she would come home and she would show us all her grades, right, straight A's, lay them out on the kitchen table. And we would say, that's wonderful. And she would say, yes, it is wonderful. And I think that deserves an iPhone. And we would say, no, it doesn't deserve an iPhone because it's not safe. And then she would score six goals for her lacrosse team and win the game. And she'd say, I won the game. I think that deserves an iPhone. And we would say, again, no, it's not safe. So one day I'm sitting in my office and she politely knocks on the door and she says, um, excuse me. I said, yes. She came in, stepped into the door, paused for a second. And then she said, did you know that if a girl has an iPhone, she's more likely to be found if she's abducted? Well, that kind of threw me. What do you think I did? Get in the car, we're going to get you an iPhone. She changed the narrative. Right. She basically said she used emotion, right? The credibility, the logic, it all made sense, right? But it was the emotional part. She turned that communication device into a safety device. And when she did that, I changed. Your words are your brand. Language is emotional. Think about brands when they communicate out. Are they positive, negative, or neutral? Most of the time they're positive because they're talking about themselves, right? But language for us. In the English language, 50% of the words are negative, 30% are positive, and 20% are neutral. We are conditioned to be more negative. My dad was an undercover narcotics cop in New York City, so my house skewed a little bit more negative than most. So it takes work to work on your positive language. Dr. Barbara Fredrickson wrote a book called Positivity and basically said, you need a three to one positive to negative ratio to be thriving in business. Look, here's what negative phrasing does. When we use negative language, and again, I'm not saying you're pumping out negative language, but even unconsciously you're doing that, right? And it goes all of these things. It usually initiates a conflict where one isn't present. And that's not great for a brand. Negative language does all of these things. It usually creates disengagement. And look, I get it. We're all good people for the most part, right? But negative language usually comes from busyness and stress. Nobody goes into work thinking, hey, today's the day I'm going to destroy somebody's self-esteem. It's going to be a great day. I don't think anybody's trying to do that, at least most people. So it really comes down to this busyness and stress. And we need to remember that we are responsible and accountable for the words that we use. So we want to be more positive. 
because positive language is processed in half the time. And I don't just mean like regular positive language. I mean, think about it this way. How many times when somebody has said to you, thank you very much, and you've said no problem? Yes, I'm sure we've all done it, right? But there's a difference there. Think about it, no problem, no problem, no problem. Those are two very negative words. We can say anything. We have access to all the words in the language and we choose no problem. I guarantee you, if you change just that part of your communication, from this day forward, that will change. What do you change it to? Well, I've consulted with the Ritz Carlton for a number of years. And if you've ever gone there or any of the higher end hospitality chains, and it's unfortunate what's happening to their industry, but they will be back and they will promote my pleasure. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I own it. Is it really their pleasure to pour you a glass of water? I don't know. Maybe, maybe if that's what their purpose is to create a wow experience for you, then yeah, we do that. And if that doesn't work for you, my pleasure. And I tried that at home. My wife said, could you take out the garbage? And I said, my pleasure. And my daughter left. She said, really, it's your pleasure? And I said, well, no, but I don't have a fight with your mother either, right? So we came up with happy to help. Can you take out the garbage? Happy to help. Was I happy to help? No, I wanted to watch the game. But again, it's this idea of communicating positivity and a positive brand. Because no problem, what does that do for anyone? That doesn't tell me that you're a positive person. That doesn't tell me that I want to work. I don't want to work for no problem, my pleasure. Your style of communication is your brand. Even simple things. How are you doing? Please take this word out of your vocabulary. Fine. How are you? Fine. You're not fine. You're passive aggressive. Fine. What is fine? Fine's wishy-washy. I do not want to work with fine. I want to work with amazing. I want to work with someone that understands powerful. How are you doing? Fine. No. Fine is not. We've got to go with absolute communication. Absolute. Be as absolute as you can be. Now, some people will tell me that that is being inauthentic. Well, I'm having a bad day, so I'm just going to have a bad day. But here's the thing. Remember this. When you have a bad day, that's a hit on your brand. But also, think about it this way. When you have a bad day and you broadcast that out, you are basically saying to people, it is okay to have a bad day. Think about as you want to move up the ladder of your organization. Am I thinking about people I'm going to promote? Am I promoting the folks that feel it's okay to have a bad day? Or am I going to promote the people who are showing me the absolute best version of themselves every day? You have a responsibility to communicate the best version of yourself every day. Some days are going to be harder than others. But I guarantee you, if you do that, if you strive for that best version of yourself, even on days when you're only about 60%, you can get to 80. You can do it. And on days when you're 80, you can get to 90 or 100. That would be fantastic. So communication, words. Maybe you're not the best writer. So use pictures, right? This is what it looked like in 2005 when the Pope was announced. And then if you saw the movie, The Two Popes, the next Pope was in 2013 was the next Pope. Look at the difference, right? We are a visual society. I mean, I don't need to show this picture anymore because... Everything we do is visual. And guess what? I love it. I love being visual because when we add visual to our communications, as I'm doing today, 111 slides, there's a 60% greater retention rate. When I send you these slides, chances are you might not remember every one of my words, but you'll know the idea because there's a visual associated with it. So think about how you are communicating who you are, your brand, your ideas. This is what it looked like when Hostess, remember Hostess? cupcakes and they were going out of business this is what they put up on uh google and you know what don't even read that i couldn't read this i said this is too much and it was interesting i was looking for something simpler so i clicked over to google images and i saw a picture of this one one picture right many words so what we want to do is we want to use visuals as best we can and i'll tell you a quick story um, when i was working with the ritz carlton down in amelia island in florida I brought my family one year. I'd been working with them for a while. So they knew me and uh, brought them down for a little vacation. I did work. And so we were having dinner. We go back to the room and this was my daughter's little stuffed puff puppy. Um, and it was gone. We couldn't find it. And my daughter was flipping out because she can't sleep without her puppy. So after about five minutes of searching and everything, my son run, ran into the room, jumped on the bed. The turndown flipped over and there was the puppy sitting under the turndown. 
So crisis averted, I didn't have to call downstairs the maid service or anything like that. Nobody stole the puppy as my daughter thought. So, you know, we all went to sleep and everything was fine. We didn't wake up the whole hotel. So I go downstairs the next day for my job to talk to the general manager and I tell him the story. Well, he wasn't very pleased with the story. I thought it was funny because crisis averted, um, but he was actually quite pissed off. And I said, well, what's the deal? And he said, we train our people to create an experience for our customers. We empower them. So this person who just stuffed the puppy in under the turndown, that was a missed opportunity. We could have had a customer for life. If What do you think would have happened if your daughter came into the room and the puppy was sitting there and a little note was written saying that the puppy was fed for the evening and a little piece of chocolate was put next to the puppy's head? We all know chocolate can kill dogs, right? That's not what I'm saying here. But what would, you, what would your daughter have, have thought? And I said, oh, that would have been amazing. I said, that would have been, you know, a really great experience for her. He goes, no, he goes, I would have owned her. I go, excuse me? He goes, I would have owned your daughter. That brand, the Ritz Carlton brand would have been associated with the daughter, your daughter's puppy. That moment, sweet 16s, weddings, retirement, everything would have happened at the Ritz Carlton. Every time she traveled, she would want to be at the Ritz Carlton. I would have had a customer for life. And that was a missed opportunity. I tell you that story because that's my story. And I've been telling this Ritz Carlton story for about 10 years. Because after I went home, I got a note from the general manager who showed me uh, this. So this was an article that I clicked open. He said, read this and showed me a picture of this guy. This is Joshy the giraffe. Joshy was lost at the Ritz Carlton by a little boy. And so when, um, when the father called up and, and said, you know, obviously we had, we had lost Joshy, the, the people in loss prevention called back and said, yes, we, we, uh, we actually found Joshy. Uh, he got caught up in the laundry and we're very sorry. Uh, he's very clean now uh, and we're gonna send him back. And the father said, great, could you do me a favor? Could you just write a little note saying that Joshy had a great time, great experience because when my kid was crying in the airport, never thought we'd see Joshy again. I lied and just said that he was gonna you know, hang out, have a great time, make new friends and he'll come home when he's ready because who wouldn't wanna leave the Ritz Carlton? And Joshy doesn't work so, you know, Joshy would come home when he wanted to. Could you just write a little note saying that Joshy had a good time? And the person in loss prevention said, my pleasure. So about two days later, a package arrives in the mail and uh, obviously overnight, and there's Joshy and he's all clean. Uh, and there's the note saying that he had a great time, but also there was a binder and that binder was filled with pictures. Joshy hanging out at the pool, Joshy at the spa, Joshy making new friends, Joshy with the mascot, Joshy driving the golf cart on the beach, Joshy working security. So here's the deal. Chris Hearn was the father of the little boy and was so moved by the pictures and the experience that he wrote an article and sent it into the Huffington Post and it went viral. This is now a standard operating procedure at the Ritz Carlton that whenever somebody loses a stuffed animal, they take the pictures. So I called the general manager and I said, this is brilliant, brilliant customer service. I said, so who thought of this in marketing? Who thought of this in operations? He said, nope, one person lost prevention, took it upon himself to create an experience for a customer. It's now a standard operating procedure across the board, they've done this at least, what I know of, at least 50, 60 times. They even did it for one very creepy 40-year-old guy who showed up with the stuffed animals and said, could you do the pictures? Not making this up. It's all about your stories becoming your brand. And if you think about it, if you're just starting out in this industry, or even if you've been here for a while, every story that somebody tells about you builds on your brand or weakens your brand. So I'm gonna go real quick through actions, reputations, take a long time to build and a short time to destroy. We all know that to be true, right? All it takes is one tweet, all it takes is one action, and your career is done. So we really need to think about that. Now, I recently wrote a book called TIP, which stands for Take It Personally. And it takes all of the principles that I'm talking about here today uh, and stand for your brand, and it puts it into an actionable uh, tool, a resource, where when you read it, it's actually a story uh, about a guy who loses his job and eventually finds himself and his brand uh, through this idea of personal branding. But it all comes down to the actions. It all comes down to what are you going to do 
when you are faced with adversity. And so tip, I used to be a bartender, like I said, tip is, if you think about it, what's a tip? A tip is something you get, right? No, it's something you give. And so the more we take it personally, the more we take the customer's experience personally, then we're more likely to do things that are more purpose-driven. And we're more likely to do things that are on brand. So in the book, I talk about ROA, return on actions, right? We're not chief financial officers, but we all have time. And what do we do with that time? There has to be a return on our actions. If we want to have a better career, then we have to make the most of every moment. So when you're building a brand, you can either be proactive, reactive, distractive, or destructive, right? Most of us are reactive. We, we do our jobs, we do it well, people tell us what to do, we do it, we're building our brand that way. Hopefully we're not distractive or destructive, especially during these times when we're, we're working from home. But the key to building a great brand is to be proactive. It's understanding what you wanna be known for. It's understanding your purpose, and then everything you do, communication, action, or otherwise, is all driving to let people know that that's who you are. Is this the best time best use of my time to reach my goals and the goals of my customers. That's what you should be asking yourself before you take any action. I worked at a place called Brother Jimmy's in New York City. This is what we handed out. This was the drink of choice. Now, this was pre-COVID was not a good idea. Post-COVID, not gonna be a good idea either. This is not a good choice. This is a hangover waiting to happen. So when I say, what are you thinking about in terms of being proactive? Lesson number one, make good choices. Lesson number two, start a task, finish a task, right? When you think about actions, whatever you start, if you finish it, that's great for your brand. The other thing, make commitments, not decisions. And I'll be honest with you, when the pandemic started, I drank. I drank more than probably I should, like most people. I didn't commit to working out. I didn't commit to anything because, all right, how long is this going to go on? Now I've got a Peloton that sits about six feet away from me in my office. I've made commitments, commitments to myself, not decisions. Decisions you can throw when something else comes along, but when you make a commitment to something, there are no other options. So make commitments to the things that are going to drive your brand. Last thing I wanna talk about is unique value, right? You've got identity, you've got communication, right? You've got your actions or your behaviors, and that all drives towards the ability to show unique value. In the book, Tip, I talk about this character uh, and they describe themselves as a just a, they're just a salesperson or they're just a person who works in insurance. And actually that idea came to me when I was working with in Gallagher Bassett, I met a few adjusters uh, and I said, what do you do? Uh, and one of them said, well, I'm just an adjuster. And the alliteration kind of hit me, but I thought about how this person devalued themselves by using the word just. They call themselves adjusta. And I hear people do it all the time. And I hear young people do it a lot more because they're just a cog in the wheel. No, you're not. You're not just to anything. If you didn't have your job, then there would be no value, right? That job exists for something. So the goal is to not devalue yourself first. That's how you create unique value. Number one, don't devalue yourself. Number two, create wow. Create wow experiences for yourself and your customers at every moment. And how do you do that? Well, your customers are basically asking these questions, whether out loud or subconsciously. Do you do these things? And if you do, chances are you are building your brand. Because think about it this way. When people choose you, we're talking about your career, right? So when people choose you, it all comes down to exposure and risk. It's insurance. Who am I going to pick? I'm going to pick the person that provides the least amount of risk for me, the least exposure for me, because I'm gonna pick someone who is known for that one thing that I need. And if you are known, if your brand says you are that person, then they're going to pick you and they're gonna feel really good about it because they are gonna be getting something solid. So it all comes back to brand behavior. It all comes back to brand consistency. Ask yourself if you're more aligned to your brand, your team, your company, your family than you were yesterday. Every day for about a month, ask yourself that. And if you're doing that, you're doing well. And, and the, people ask me, well, how will I know? It's real, very simple. What are people saying about you when you're not in the room? What's your label? Is it the same thing that they're saying that, they, that you want them to say? And if so, 
then you've done a great job. So I'm coming to the end of my presentation. I'm gonna open it up for questions. Um, you can find out all of this information about me and what I do, davegordon.net, um, social media, davegordon underscore nine. Uh, I'm giving you my personal email address as opposed to my work email address. And that is my cell phone number. So if you at some point want to text or call, you have a question about your career. Uh, I love doing this. I love talking about this. The branding is my passion, uh, both for companies and for people, obviously. Um, in the book, if you choose to go out there, it's on Amazon, it's on Barnes and Noble, it's everywhere. But there is something you can just, you don't even need the book if you didn't want to, but if you go onto the website, there is a download, which basically I, I have up in my office still. I created it and I still have it up as a reminder, but it's basically, if you wanna build up your reputational value, you have to have personal accountability. And to do that, you have to build your tip jar. You have to keep filling it. So we've got some takeaway tips that you can get all the different things you need on the website. So what I'm gonna do now with nine minutes left is I'm gonna open it up for questions. You can ask me anything. Please use either the chat bar or the question bar. Uh, I'll look at it uh, and we will go from there. Um, so Amy, if you see it before I do, uh, let me know. Any questions at all? I will answer anything uh, about branding, personal branding, acting, the show Friends. No, just kidding. What do you want to know? Let me put it to you this way. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. What is the one thing that you're going to do differently after today? So we just spent almost an hour together. That was an hour of your time, an hour of my time obviously return on action you took an hour what are you going to do differently that's going to further your career and be proactive and dave we've got a, a couple of questions in the chat too um Fantastic. would you like me to ask them uh let's can i open these up yeah could you i think yeah because i can't open these up yes please sure um do you think that you can change your brand make career or enhance it absolutely um, I've done it. Uh, you absolutely can. Again, I was an actor uh, known for a certain thing. I was uh, a salesperson. I was a head of sales. Now I'm a chief marketing officer. I never let my title define me. When you say brand, you might also think of what you're being known for. Um, if you're being known for being too much of something, it's always easy to change. First, you have to define what it is that you want to be, and then you must be relentless in being that new brand so if you think about it and i'll just use um you know some people are i don't let's say that somebody is obnoxious we say i really my brand i'm known for being obnoxious well then you've got to pull back and say all right let's do a little bit of a focus group let's ask people what's my brand and if that's consistently coming across and that's not your intention some people like being obnoxious right but if it's not your intention then you have to ask yourself, okay, what are the behaviors? What's the communication? What are the actions that are being associated with being that way? And then how can I change that? And then it's about being consistent with the communication. It's being consistent with the actions. And if you do that over time, people will see that you're different. But here's the thing. If you really do want to change, all it takes is one slip up where people go, yep, now they're, they're, they're the same person they always were. So you have to be committed to being that new brand. Does that make sense, Amy? Yes, uh, and thank you, Brittany, for that question. The next question we have is, what's the best tip for the virtual selling world we're in now? Yeah, so it's tough, right? I, I think the virtual selling world is as much about marketing as it is about selling. And so when you think about that, you've got to put yourself out there on a consistent basis. I think it comes down to, and this is just my personal uh, opinion, it's about creativity. I think in a virtual world, there's even more noise than in a non-virtual world. And so how do you distinguish yourself? Um, obviously, you know, you've got to make sure that your LinkedIn profile is saying something about you that is different and unique um, and also on brand. Um, make sure that you're posting things that can provide you as a thought leader. So if you really think about it, you know, 
Um, everybody is Googleable. There's a word. Um, so when I search for you, what comes up? If nothing comes up, then then you don't have a brand, right? In a virtual world, everybody needs a brand. So it took me many years to, and I'm not saying everybody go out and create your own website and write your own book and then do your keynote presentations that you can find online. But I knew that was important to me to, me to build a brand. And so in a virtual selling world, you are selling yourself still as much as you're selling a product or service. So it's very important that whatever you're putting out there be consistent and also be frequent, but not noise. Creativity helps. So an example, and again, be appropriate with your company and your customers, but sending pictures like the Twinkie thing, right? To me, that made me laugh. When somebody sends me something that makes me laugh, that's appropriate or is a statistic that I didn't know or teaches me something. Go back to that list that I shared with you and I will, let's see if I can pull that back here. Uh, I will go to that laundry list real quick. Here we go. In a virtual selling world, do you do these things? This doesn't matter whether you're live or virtual. Can you do any one of those things? And if you do, I'll buy from you. I'll buy you because you're doing these for me. Because just remember that selling is all about them, not you. So whatever you can provide here, I would take this. And Amy, what I'll do is I'll send you a copy of this as a PDF. And um, if you want to distribute to whoever the attendees are, uh, I have a, people tell me um, that they usually take this slide and hang it up as a reminder when they're talking to a client uh, or a prospect what to do. Yes, that would be wonderful. And uh, do we have time for one more question? From my side, you can, we can talk all day long. So whatever you want. <laughs> All right, let's just take one more uh, from Megan. What's a good way of assessing whether you've communicated your desired brand successfully? Example, what people are saying about you. Yeah, so that's a great question. And the answer is you got to ask. Um, so um, there's an action plan that I use uh, that, again, I'm a marketing guy, right? I'm a brand guy. And we try not to do anything without a bit of a focus group. And so what you really need to do is ask. So I always like to say, grab about seven, eight, nine people at the most in your life, personal, professional, otherwise, and do a baseline. Ask them, what do you think of my brand? And they might be like, what do you mean your brand? Your brand is not you. That's the thing. If you explain what a brand is, it's how you are. Again, what is your unique promise of value? And that way people won't be dishonest with you about trying to, you know, not hurt your feelings or call you this or call you that, right? What is your brand? And ask people that. Um, and, and when you do that, when you ask a few of these questions, you'll get a sense of what people think about you. Then you say, okay, based on what I've heard, that's my label, not happy with that. So here's my aspirational brand. Then start communicating, start acting and take those same people and ask them again, maybe three months, six months, a year later, do that focus group and say, have, have I changed? What do you think of my brand now? Has it changed? You'll never know until you ask. Um, and you can also see from the responses. And, and I've had uh, numerous occasions where I've worked with folks, giving them some advice, giving them some, you know, just small things to do to change their behaviors. And they'll find just those little things will make a change. The communication part, I think, is is ideal. That's something that you can do tomorrow. You can stop saying no problem. You can be someone that somebody actually wants to call or write back to and be somebody that is going to foster energy. Because here's what you have to remember. People are selfish. They want to be around people that make them feel better, that make them more energetic. If you are the life suck in the room, nobody wants to be around you. So it's really important for you to make sure that you're doing those things. So how do you know? You're going to have to ask. And sometimes that's the scariest part of this whole thing. If you don't ask, then you won't know. Thank you so much, Dave. This has been an excellent um, hour with you and we all appreciate you getting on. 
If you like what you heard today, please check back the events calendar on the RISE website. Uh, and again, don't uh, hesitate to reach out to Dave. He's presented his personal information for you to reach out. Uh, we will go ahead and distribute this afterwards. And with that, we thank you for joining us. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone.